That was a wonderful introduction. Uh, it was just one small quibble with it. Uh, although I am, for the most part, a, a one-man shop, um, I have had allies uh, for really almost now uh, 25 years in bringing lawsuits that uh, uh, challenge the use of race and ethnicity in various endeavors, whether it's higher education or employment or contracting. And one of my best allies is right here in the room, uh, Ed Chen and his wife Eugenia Chen. When I filed my first lawsuit in 1993, I had just lost an election uh, running uh, to represent the 18th Congressional District of Texas. I was the Republican nominee, and uh, I was defeated. I didn't, I didn't win. Uh, most people didn't think I would win. Uh, uh, but I was upset with the way that the district here in Texas was drawn. It was drawn along the lines of a racial gerrymander. And what that really meant was that neighborhoods in Houston that were multiracial and multi-ethnic were split apart by their race and ethnicity to create safe, homogenous racial districts. So in Spring Branch, one side of a street might be mostly African American. They were put into one district. The other side of the street was mostly Hispanic. They were put into another district. And these districts ran dozens of miles in different directions. So these neighborhoods were split apart just because the residents were different races. Well, Ed Chen and I and a few others filed a lawsuit challenging that. And Ed was there at the very beginning. That lawsuit uh, was the first lawsuit I had ever filed in my life. I think probably the first lawsuit Ed had ever filed in his life. And we challenged the, the state of Texas. And that lawsuit was actually heard by the US Supreme Court. That was our first Supreme Court lawsuit. And um, we won. Uh, so, uh, David, thank you for uh, saying I'm a kind of a lone ranger, but I've, I've, I've had a lot of wonderful supporters and help along the way. And, and Houston, Houston uh, Ed and Eugenia Chen uh, marked that. So let me talk a little bit about uh, the state of the law. David gave a very good overview of uh, the use of race and ethnicity uh, as the courts have looked at it over the last now since 1978. So I want to talk about three lawsuits that have been filed that, that in one way or another challenged the use of racial classifications and preferences in, in higher, higher admissions. The first case was, was filed by a man named Alan Bakke, B-A-K-K-E, -E, who uh, applied to the University of California at Davis Medical School and was rejected. Uh, he filed a lawsuit uh, challenging what was then a hard racial quota at the University of California at Davis. That is, California at Davis admitted 100 medical students a year, and of those 100, 16 slots, not 15, not 19, 16 slots were set aside for African Americans. He challenged that. That case was heard by the US Supreme Court, and the US Supreme Court ruled in Alan Bakke's favor. They ruled that hard quotas like that are unconstitutional. But, as David pointed out, they did not rule against the use of race and ethnicity in general. They said colleges and universities can continue classifying their applicants by race. You have to check a little box. You're Asian, you check this box. You're white, you check this box. They can still do that, and they can still raise the bar for some and lower the bar for others. That's still OK in the pursuit of this goal called diversity. But what they couldn't do is have a hard quota. That was the first major lawsuit. The next lawsuit came in 2003 when two white applicants 
challenged, one challenged the University of Michigan's undergraduate program, and the other challenged the University of Michigan's law school program. Uh, in, in those cases, the plaintiffs brought a facial challenge to the use of race and ethnicity. That is, they didn't argue that, that well, there's quotas here and we need to end the quotas. They argued, well, there are quotas, but we need to end the use of classifications and preferences, period. Well, the court didn't see it that way. The court found that the University of Michigan undergraduate program was a quota, and they struck that down as a quota, but they didn't strike down as a quota of the University of Michigan's law school admissions policies, and they also sort of strengthened to a modest degree the latitude that universities have in raising the bar for some and lowering it for others. So that was a setback for those of us who believe that your race and ethnicity should not be a factor either to help you gain admission to a university or a job or to harm you in, 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 in those settings. Um, one of the interesting things that came out of that case was uh, the Supreme Court said, look, before a university is allowed to raise the bar or lower the bar, if they, they must attempt to try something race neutral to achieve this diversity. So uh, what that meant, at least for the University of Texas lawsuit, which was the one that came right, right after the University of Michigan was, the University of Texas has, as all of you probably know, something called uh, a, a top 10% uh, admissions policy. That top 10% admissions policy was passed by the legislature in 1997, signed into law by then Governor Bush, and that required every college, every public college in the state of Texas to admit any student who graduated in the top 10% of his or her graduating high school class. Now, prior to this uh, law, the University of Texas was uh, using race-based affirmative action. That is, the University of Texas was classifying people and treating them differently. Well, that was struck down in 1997 by a local Texas court. So Texas, in 1997, had to abandon the use of race and ethnicity, and instead they implemented this race-neutral top 10% plan. So what happened to the University of Texas uh, uh, student body in 1998 and 1999 and 2000? Well, to no one's surprise, at least not to my surprise, the number of African Americans and Hispanics and Asians started to go up dramatically at the University of Texas uh, for various reasons. Part of it is there are uh, high schools still in this state that are primarily African American, high schools that are still primarily Hispanic. So now those kids had a shot at going to the University of Texas and because Asians uh, seem to be uh, graduating in uh, the top tranches of public high schools throughout the state of Texas. Asians now, uh, uh, their population started to, started to expand at the University of Texas. So uh, as it turned out, it was unnecessary for the University of Texas to use affirmative action when they had this top 10% plan in place. Well, the day that the University of Michigan cases came down in 2003, the University of Texas said, wait a minute, we're now allowed to reintroduce race into the equation. That now the Supreme Court has said colleges and universities unequivocally can use race. We, the University of Texas, who have not been using race, but instead have been using this top 10% plan, while we are going to still continue using the top 10% plan, now we're going to add race-based affirmative action on top of it. The day that 
opinion came down is the day that the University of Texas announced what they were going to do. And that was the day that I and others decided that the University of Texas was about to undertake something that was unconstitutional. And that is reintroducing race on top of something that was already effective. So in 2008, Abigail Fisher, uh, who attended a high school out in Sugarland, applied to the University of Texas. She was in the 11th percentile of her graduating class, so she didn't quite make it to the top 10. So she had to apply, uh, and because of that, we argue that her race was used against her uh, in the admissions process. We sued, we, uh, we lost at the district court in Austin. We took our case then on appeal to the Fifth Circuit in New Orleans. We lost there as well. And we then took our appeal all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court agreed to hear the case. Uh, the case was argued, and it was decided in June of 2013. It's a long time from 2008 to 2013. And the Supreme Court said that what the University of Texas did was wrong. We won the case seven to one. Now, Justice Kagan was recused from the case because there's nine justices, so she, couldn't, she could not participate uh, because she had already worked on the case when she was in the Department of Justice. Uh, but we didn't, even though we won, we didn't win much. What we won was that uh, the University of Texas had applied the wrong standard when it reintroduced race, that uh, they needed to go back and apply the new standard that the Supreme Court uh, had, had uh, articulated in the Fisher case. And if they could overcome that new standard, then the University of Texas could use race. But it was hinted, at least in the, in the opinion, that uh, the justices didn't think that the University of Texas would, would be able to overcome that particular hurdle. So the case came back to Texas. Uh, we uh, did a new round of briefing, a new round of argument, and lo and behold, we lost again. Uh, so we've never won in the state of Texas. The only place we've ever won is the Supreme Court. And on May the 21st, just a month or so from now, the Supreme Court will determine whether it's going to take Abigail's case once more. So if, they, if the justices take that case, then the issue that all of us are here to discuss today will become very prominent once again. We don't anticipate the Fisher case ever being the right case to end the use of race and ethnicity in higher education. When we filed that case, we didn't ask the court to do it because we felt that it would take a couple of cases uh, to develop our theories and find the right set of facts to do it. But if we win again at the Supreme Court, uh, we think the, the hurdle that they articulated the first time in 2013, that hurdle will be raised, it will be more fully fleshed out, and uh, uh, at least for the next two or three years, while the Harvard lawsuit is being uh, pursued and the UNC lawsuit is being pursued, um, uh, it will be uh, harder for universities to use race and ethnicity, not impossible. Now, how do we go about making it impossible for universities? Oh, thank you. How do we make it uh, impossible for universities to use race and ethnicity? And that's where the Harvard lawsuit and the UNC lawsuits come in. So here's what I did. Um, I decided, right after the Fisher case was, was decided in 2013, that the next step in this process that began with Alan Bakke applying to medical school back in 1978 would be to challenge outright to ask the court to end the use of race, period, in the admissions process. And what that means is that when, when David Cow's children apply to Duke or to Stanford or to Yale, on the application, there is no box that 
should be checked to determine whether you're uh, Asian, whether you're Japanese, whether you're Pakistani, whether you're Indian, whether you're white, black, Hispanic, it, all those boxes will go away. And rather than have names like uh, Sam Cow or uh, 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 Ed Chen or I don't know, you know, Milton Rabinowitz or Sammy Garcia, all the names are redacted so that people reviewing those applications won't say, aha, here's an Asian, we have too many of those already. Or here's a Hispanic, God, we really need more of those, let's admit him. So that's the goal of these lawsuits, is to eliminate the consideration of race or ethnicity in, uh, in applying. So I, um, I needed plaintiffs. I needed Asian plaintiffs. And finding plaintiffs to challenge uh, the Ivy League admissions policies. Harvard in particular is not an easy thing to do. So I started, uh, uh, I um, uh, designed three websites, harvardnotfair.org, UNC, University of North Carolina, notfair.org, and uwnotfair.org, University of Wisconsin. And I launched these three websites, and I put out a press release, and I had uh, some friends help out with doing press events in Madison, Wisconsin, Boston, Massachusetts, and Charlotte, North Carolina. And lo and behold, we had some, uh, some press coverage. It was very helpful. Some of the press coverage wasn't very uh, um, commendatory. It, they, uh, the reporters didn't really uh, like what we were doing, and you could tell that from the stories that they wrote and the editorials that appeared in newspapers, but it, it did the trick, and we ended up with, uh, through those websites, with, uh, at Harvard specifically, about 300 students who had either recently been denied admission to Harvard or uh, who had been denied admission to Harvard in the past telling us their story. And their story was absolutely remarkable. These kids were valedictorians. They are uh, uh, either immigrants to this country or first generation from China, Vietnam, India, uh, Korea. Uh, they had uh, outstanding uh, test scores, outstanding uh, AP uh, exposure and AP uh, course uh, grades. They uh, won science exams. They won debates. They won tennis tournaments. They played golf. They did everything that you would want kids to do when they're competing at, at the most competitive uh, uh, schools in, in, in the country. So those websites led me to, uh, frankly, just one individual, one Chinese young man from California, his father contacted me and said, we're interested in pursuing this. I got on a plane, I flew out to California, uh, I met with the family, I met uh, to make sure that they understood what they were getting into, and uh, they agreed, and lo and behold, uh, the websites were launched in April, on November the 17th, 2014, we filed a lawsuit against Harvard, and we filed a lawsuit against the University of North Carolina. I have yet to file a lawsuit against the University of Wisconsin because I haven't found anyone willing to um, uh, sort of be the, the plaintiff. Now let me, let me stop and tell you about the structure of the Harvard lawsuit, because it's important that you understand what we've done differently with Harvard that we did with when Ed and I sued the state of Texas and when Abigail Fisher sued uh, the University of Texas. What we did was no one today knows the name of the young man who has, who has filed this lawsuit. We formed an organization, and that's the, the handout that you have. 
we formed an organization called Students for Fair Admissions. And it is a not-for-profit 501c3 organization that has now been recognized by the Internal Revenue Service as being a, a legitimate not-for-profit public interest charity. Uh, we have members. Uh, Students for Fair Admissions now has a little over 300 members. And I encourage all of you to, to join it. Go to the website and you can join it. All that it requires is your name, uh, your email address, and I think that's it. You can become a member. Or uh, if you have been denied admission, if you're a 17, 18, or 19 year old who has been denied admission to a college or university, you can do more than join. You can not only join, but you can tell us about yourself. So of the 300, I would say we probably have about 100 students throughout the country who have told us their names, their SAT scores, what year they applied to college, the colleges that rejected them, and something a little bit about their extracurricular activities. So of the 100, uh, I have reached out to, I'd say, about a dozen additional Asians and contacted them and said the following. Look, sooner or later, Harvard is going to want to know the name of our members who have applied. That, that's, that's coming. Uh, what we're going to ask Harvard and what we're going to ask the court is that the names of those students remain confidential. That once Harvard establishes that these students were academically competitive and that yes indeed they applied and yes indeed they were rejected, that it's not necessary for their names to come out in public. Now, Harvard may agree to that. They may disagree with that. The court may agree to seal those names, or the court may disagree with that. So what I wanted to make sure was that each student who said, I'm willing to have my name revealed, understood that there'll be no depositions. You won't have to testify in court. Uh, Abigail Fisher never did anything. She never, uh, in all of the court cases, uh, the, the, the trials that we had, the arguments, I should say, Abby was at LSU. She never came. The only time Abby ever set foot in a courtroom was at the Supreme Court, and I insisted that she come. So um, uh, we don't anticipate students who join this and agree to be the, quote, harmed plaintiff. There's nothing really for them to do other than perhaps be aware that their names may become public. We don't think that'll happen, but it's, it's a possibility. So that one student who agreed to go forward, he is the Lone Ranger, not me. He is the one that said, okay, uh, I applied to Harvard, I was rejected. Instead, I'm going to the University of California at Berkeley, with some scholarship money, by the way. So he's at Berkeley, he is aware that one day his name may come out, and all the other about dozen students now uh, realize that their names may come out. But even though they were rejected by uh, Harvard, they're now at places like uh, Stony Brook, Duke, Stanford, I think one is at uh, Georgetown, uh, Caltech, two or three went to Caltech, I think one went to MIT. So all of these kids are you know, in other competitive schools, they just weren't admitted uh, to Harvard. So, uh, the course of the litigation is going to be long and arduous. We are in a phase now called discovery. And what this means is that over the next year or so, uh, we have asked Harvard and the University of North Carolina for their admission data. Uh, Harvard um, used to provide this admission data uh, just as a matter of course. Uh, Harvard will every year announce the percentages of Asians and African Americans and whites and Hispanics that it admits, but in 2003, Harvard stopped providing data showing the number of applicants by race and ethnicity to Harvard. Now that's an interesting coincidence. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so uh, for dozens of years, you could look at Harvard's uh, admissions mm -hmm. pool and say, oh, of the 35,000 students that applied to Harvard, um, oh, you know, 4,200 were African American. Uh, 2,800 uh, were Hispanic and this percentage white and this percentage Asian. Well, just a few weeks after the University of Michigan cases were decided, Harvard ended that practice. Now, why did they do that? Whereas the University of Texas and most public institutions continue to make that information available, they have to, often by, by state statute and by FOIA requests. But Harvard and many of the other Ivy Leagues have stopped doing that. Now, why have they stopped doing that? And all of this is going to come out in the discovery process is because we believe that at Harvard specifically, of the 35,000 students that apply, uh, somewhere around 18,000, give or take, are Asian. That means that a significant percentage of Harvard applicants are Asian. Our initial studies that have been done by, by scholars, uh, widely respected, uh, uh, also suggest that of the students applying to Harvard who score 2,200 or higher on their SATs, 45% uh, of those applicants are Asian. And of the students that score 2,300 or higher on their SATs, 55% are Asian. So, it's our belief that Harvard and Yale and Princeton and the other Ivy Leagues simply won't take uh, applicants who score much below 2,000 on their combined SATs. That's about the cutoff, regardless of your race. So it seems that, that if, if Asians were in the lower tranches of, of SAT performance, then it would be no surprise that maybe their numbers were static. But their, uh, our data suggests that that's not the case at all. And what we have are a couple of control groups that, um, that we point to in our complaint that will additionally come out in this discovery process that we believe will prove that Harvard has an unfair and unconstitutional quota against Asians. And that is uh, what is happening at schools like Berkeley, specifically, and Caltech, specifically. So, in 1992, Harvard admitted 19% of its freshman class were Asian. In 2011 and 2012, about 17% of its admitted class were Asian. Now, what has happened to the Asian population during this period of time? We estimate that the number of Asian applicants to these schools has better than doubled, but not quite tripled. We don't know where that number is. Because of the, the growth in America's Asian population, uh, we can track this. So, what has happened uh, at schools that don't use race and ethnicity as a factor. Well, we have two schools that I just mentioned, Caltech and Berkeley. Well, in 1992, the number of Asians admitted to Caltech was 25%. In 2011, it is over 40%. So as the Asian population has grown nationally, those schools that have admission criteria much like Harvard have seen their Asian population go up significantly. Same story at, at Berkeley. 1992, I think it was about 16 or 17 percent Asian. They were forbidden to use race beginning in 1996. Now Asian population at Berkeley, I think last year, was also over 40 percent. So schools that don't use race have seen this, 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 this increase 
Yet Harvard, year after year after year after year, is the same. 17, 18, 16, 19, 17, 16. Now, that kind of flatlining in, in light of the growing number of highly qualified Asian applicants suggests a quota. And remember, back in 1978 in Baki, the quotas are unfair and unconstitutional. Same thing in Michigan, quotas unfair and unconstitutional. So we've approached the Harvard lawsuit on two fronts. We've said, number one, Harvard has a quota. They're denying it's a quota, but for all intents and purposes, it's a quota. And then secondly, we're asking the justices, look, in 78, you said it was OK, but there had to be certain parameters before it was OK. In 2003, you said quotas are not OK, but race could be OK. 2008, you kind of danced around it, but the time has come when America is so multiracial and multiethnic that it is no longer uh, a question of whites versus blacks, which is what the affirmative action policies were originally designed to address. Now we have a multiracial, multiethnic society in which Asians are being penalized. There is a bamboo ceiling uh, 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 against Asians in America's most competitive universities, and who is benefiting from these quotas against Asians. African Americans are benefiting, Hispanics are benefiting, and whites are benefiting. Whites are overrepresented at the Ivy League based upon the data that, we've, that we have gathered, what we know to be admissions uh, uh, trends. So we're going to go to the court and say, this is not about whites and blacks. This is now you're pitting a multiracial America against one another. And um, uh, hopefully we'll succeed at that. Discovery will last about a year. Uh, there will then be a series of, of uh, perhaps a, a trial uh, uh, or uh, motions for summary judgment. Uh, the court will consider it. We think in about two years, a year and a half to two years from now, we will have um, our opinion from the local court in Boston. That's win or lose. Everyone recognizes that the next step is the Court of Appeals, uh, and then after that, the Supreme Court. So just like it took about four years for Abby Fisher's case to be heard, almost five, uh, now we're going on seven years by the time the Supreme Court has sent it back, and now we're going back up again. Um, it could be a very long slog. So. Um, I'll stop here. I encourage all of you to please join Students for Fair Admissions. Uh, pass the word about it. Um, the, uh, any financial help that you can, that you can uh, uh, render in this would be greatly appreciated. Um, I think there's a, uh, some note about how to go about doing that on the, on the handout. Um, we have lawyers who uh, estimate that it will cost about a million dollars a year, David and I were talking about this, about a million dollars a year to pursue the, the Harvard lawsuit, a little less for the University of North Carolina. I've raised money that takes us through about the first year. Uh, I'm hopeful that uh, you know we'll have money for them the second year and the third year and the fourth year, but um, uh, whatever you can do to help uh, would be greatly appreciated. But joining and passing the word about students who have been rejected and uh, uh, participating in this is very important. We need new students every year because at some point our old students that joined last year will no longer, although they'll be members, the court won't recognize them as harmed members. So we need new Asian students joining all the time. So thank you and I'll take questions uh, from it from anyone now.